Tonight's moderator is Tamara K. Knopper, a sociologist whose scholarship examines Asian Americans and race and class politics. She has worked in community activism related to Asian immigrants' neighborhood and work conditions and peace anti-war organizing. Please welcome Tamara. <laughs> Hi, how is everybody doing? Good? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I also want to thank the Asian American Writers Workshop, um, Ken Chen, and also, oh, thank you, and also um, Sophia Hussein um, for the invitation to moderate. I'm a sociologist, as they mentioned, um, but I was once an English major. I was terrible at poetry, so I went into sociology. But I am deeply honored to be able to be in conversation tonight with the different people on this panel and to be able to kind of think sociologically and um, poetically with them. So this is a great honor, so thank you. I want to introduce first Christine Kitano. She is the author of Sky Country, a book of poetry published by BOA Editions in 2017 and Birds of Paradise. Poet Ada Limon wrote, writes, excuse me, the poems in Sky Country weave unravel and stitch together history and time with such a fierce originality that the images buzz in the mind. Lyrically vibrant and sonically alive. Ooh, lyrically vibrant and sonically alive. That's so lovely, isn't it? Um, Kitano's gorgeous poems remind us that we are always linked to immigration, to the women that raised us, and it's through our own language that we do the honoring. Christine was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, and currently lives in Ithaca, New York, where she is an assistant professor of creative writing, poetry, and Asian American literature at Ithaca College. Christine Katana. All right. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out, and thank you to the Asian American Writers Workshop for having me. Uh, when I walked in here, I saw all these books, and this is uh, I've never seen every book that I've wanted to read or felt like I should read or have read in the same condensed space. And it's really amazing for me to get to read here uh, for you guys. Uh, so I'll be reading from Sky Country. Let's see. And I'll be reading a few poems that are about the Japanese American incarceration, which is obviously the theme for tonight. And my father and his family were incarcerated at Topaz concentration camp in Utah uh, during World War II. And it was a topic that I knew I wanted to write about. Uh, but when I was working on my second book, I knew I didn't want to attack it from a directly autobiographical point. I wanted to explore these stories and see if there was a way for me to actually reimagine these stories rather than just uh, telling the stories I had been heard. And so that was how I came to start working in persona. So the poems I'll read from are all told from a persona who is a fictional character loosely based on my uh, grandmother, uh, but she is a young Issei that is first generation Japanese American immigrant. And I imagined her as a woman who had left her life in Japan, come to the United States, gotten married, had a child, started this life, uh, only to have that life taken away when she was incarcerated. So she's the speaker in these poems. The first poem I'll read is titled Gaman, which is a Japanese word that translates loosely to perseverance. And it was a word that was often used to describe the Japanese American reaction to the incarceration. Gaman. It was night when the buses stopped. It was too dark to see the road or if there was a road. So we waited, we watched, we thought of back home, how the orchards would swell with fruit, how the trees would strain, then give way under their ripe weight. The pockmarked moon, the face of an apple, pitted with rot. But of course not. Someone would intervene, would make of our absence a profit. When we came, the boat anchored at San Francisco Bay swayed for hours. The gauntlet of uniformed men so intent on finding cause to turn us away. And now again we wait, we watch, our American children press against us with their small backs, which gives us pause. For the sake of the children, we'll teach them to forgive the fears of others, the offenses. 
but what we don't anticipate is how the dust of the desert will clot our throats, how much fear will conspire to keep us silent, and how our children will read this silence as shame, however much we tried, we thought, to demonstrate grace. When the buses stopped, it was too dark to see the road, or if there was a road. It was night, and instead of, instead of speaking, we waited. Instead of speaking, we watched. So I imagine this speaker incarcerated at Topaz, and also at Topaz was uh, a painter named Chirora Obata. And if you've never seen any of his paintings, he painted from inside camp, looking out at the mountains. And as I was looking at these paintings, uh, I realized there was just a lot of stillness in those paintings, and that was something I wanted to get across. So this is the next poem that's about that. It's called, I Will Explain Hope. But not today. Not when the wind carries only the voices of geese crying but sailing far above our human heads. Down here, I'd swear I feel the earth's subtle tug on its slow travel around a distant sun. But I'd also believe time stopped within this patch of desert. That elsewhere, lives go on making marked progress, but we remain stranded within a stalled circle, surrounded by a light that fails and fails to reach us. How far and fast it travels, this light that is already dead. How far and fast it must journey, the prayer whispered in the dark. What choice but to forgive such a brave failure? This is called Fireflies. Because they have never seen anything like it, the city children weave through the barracks calling us to come see. Our stories of fireflies in Japan must echo in their young heads, how we'd picnic in summer heat to watch the lit bodies punctuate the dark. Better than Christmas, we told them. So when they pull us into the Utah night, how to tell them these pulsing clouds are not fireflies, but moths. Still, we chase them through the desert fields, the children cupping small fists around moon-whitened wings that collapse, not from the children's touch, but the sheer pressure of air. My mother would say the fireflies are the lights of soldiers killed in a war far away, their spirits now wandering the earth in search of home. But these are not fireflies. How to say fireflies don't come to Utah, how to say how close or far we are from home, how to say where we are at all. My daughter catches one, its brief body torn and flickering in her palm. I teach her the word hotaru, firefly. Together we trace the letters in the dirt with our fingers. But the next morning, when she peeks outside, she cries to find the characters gone, the name on the earth already erased by the wind. So when I was doing my research about what life was like in camp, uh, I found this story about a woman saying that the men in the camp had gone out to the surrounding mountains and uprooted trees and brought those trees back and planted them around the barracks. And it was such a strange and fantastic story, I wanted to give that story to this speaker as one of her memories. So this poem takes place later in her life and she's recalling her camp experience. It's called About the Trees. Somewhere in central Utah, off the loneliest road in America, grows a plot of scattered trees. That first fall, men carved shrubs from the surrounding mountains and transplanted them around camp. Sure they'd die, we were all surprised when, in spring, knuckles of green burst from the branches. The soil was grainy and soft as sand. The trees were a miracle, as if born from a handful of shadow. Maybe miracle is too strong a word. I once thought it easy to believe a vivid memory was all that mattered. But now, sometimes I see the trunks skeletal and bare, the branches hardened to iron, or they're lush as evergreens in winter. How much depends on how we're willing to remember. Now I sleep in an air-conditioned room and watch television long past dark. And when they ask me about camp, I sift through memories for a funny anecdote.
of food or the smell of the latrines. This morning, I woke before dawn. I stared at the clock's neon numbers, my hands again full of shadows. Believe me, the men were not angry. But when they dug the trees from the earth, anger bled through their hands. The men returned with the trees over their shoulders, the stunned roots aloft and curled into incomplete fists. And the last poem I'll read is a short poem, and this is returning to my story. So those were told from the point of view of a fictional speaker. Uh, this is a poem where nothing is made up, everything here is true. And it's about my father and a story that I had heard about him. Uh, he was 16 when he was evacuated, and um, the story is what he took when he was told he could only take what he could carry. So it's titled 1942, in response to Executive Order 9066, my father, 16, takes no spare underwear, no clean shirts, pants, or good shoes. Instead, a suitcase of records, his trombone. This is not the whole story, and yet it is true. It is a story without an ending, and when I open my mouth to speak, it continues. Thank you. Um, before I introduce Violetta Monera from Families for Freedom, who will then introduce Mr. Walker as the speaker from Families for Freedom, just a friendly reminder that um, they do not want to be videotaped, um, even though the audio will be available to people. Um, and I just want to say real quickly, you know, 10 years ago I was on a panel at the Association of Black Sociologists with two of the co-founders for Families for Freedom, Subhash Katil and Artie Shahani, <coughs> who co-founded the organization with Maria Muentes. And it was a very powerful experience because I remember, um, sorry, I'm a little nervous, that they were theorizing kind of how to think about um, criminal uh, enforcement and the ways that immigrants who um, are convicted in the criminal justice system, how they sometimes get distinguished from those who are deported for more um, administrative reasons. And for those who don't know, um, within immigrant rights activism, this has been a major kind of tension. And so organizations like Families for Freedom, Baji, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, um, DRUM, Daisy's Rising Up and Moving, CAV, right? They've been very pivotal in kind of really pushing um, a real commitment to thinking about those immigrants who are oftentimes marginalized within our communities and who sometimes um, other people don't want to claim, right? Except for the people who love them and care for them. So it's a real honor to be able to introduce speakers from Families for Freedom, thinking back on kind of um, my uh, history with interacting with some of the people from the organization. So uh, Violetta Monera um, will be introducing um, Mr. Walker from Families for Freedom. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much. Um, for giving us this opportunity to be in collaboration with such an amazing um, group of people and writers. Uh, we are in deep gratitude uh, for, provide, for being given this space. Um, so, um, yeah, so um, a little bit about Families for Freedom. Um, Families for Freedom has played and continues to play a very unique role in the immigration justice movement. And as some of, some people have mentioned, um, we were founded in 2002 in the aftermath of the September 11 attacks. And we are a multi-ethnic membership-led organization that supports people in detention and their loved ones by helping them navigate through the complexity of the immigration system. So. We also provide a space for organizing where our members regain and use their power to create change in the unjust immigration system. And our members support, advocate, and stand in solidarity with one another, regardless of where they come from, their immigration status, race, gender, sexual identity, or expression, but most importantly, regardless of their criminal records. Um, it is our mission to 
assess and to continue building the power of people who are directly affected by exclusionary and punishing laws such as the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, known as AEDPA, and the Illegal, Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigration Responsibility Act, the IIRIRA, which have come to be known as the 1996 laws. Um, and it is our goal to, in the movement, lead this um, change, this nar narrative of change, in a way that engages members and allies to roll back mandatory detention and deportation for all. So um, tonight you will be listening to one of our members and someone that is a very valuable staff um, for us, Mr. Walker. So Mr. Walker has been at Families for Freedom member since 2006. And he first came in contact with Families for Freedom in January 2013 while he was detained in Batavia Buffalo Detention Center through the free national detainee hotline that Families for Freedom established in detention centers nationwide. After years of volunteering his time helping others in detention and as a directly impacted person, Walker's role in the organization brings an invaluable perspective into FFF's, into Families for Freedom's work and his firsthand experience and knowledge of the immigration detention complex is what makes his role as a hotline supervisor so important. So Walker embodies what Families for Freedom strives for, which has always been to empower people to become active participants in the fights for human rights, but more specifically in the fight to end detention and deportation for all. So please welcome Mr. Walker. <laughs> Once again, thank you for having us. Um, we really appreciate this opportunity. And um, I'm not really nervous with, 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 being, you know, with having to express to you uh, my experiences in detention, but it's still a very emotional thing for me. The, the memories of the kind of experiences I have had are still you know, traumatizing for me. Um, like Violetta mentioned, the 1996 laws are, are, are the laws that drove the nail in the coffin for immigrants in the United States. The, the, these laws changed the way immigrants were processed or were handled in the immigration system. It changed um, the, it, 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 in, it changed the, the number of, or the different types of convictions that um, immigrants could have been deported for. It made convictions in, before 1996 retroactive and created mandatory detention and mandatory deportation for certain offenses. The 1996 laws also expanded the um, aggravated felonies, the, the crimes that constituted aggravated felonies to the extent that it, it, it made it uh, much easier or it made it, it made it possible to deport a greater number of people are uh, immigrants to the United States. This, uh, the 1996 laws uh, were passed after several attempts failed, and only so because of what occurred, I don't know if you remember the Oklahoma bombing in 1995. It was only at that point they were able to have bipartisan support to pass those laws. And we're seeing a similar situation occurring right now with the movement, to, the, the effort to pass DACA, um, where they're, they're now trying to, because they want to have funding for more militarization of the border, for building a wall, 
an ending chain migration, right? They are now trying to piggyback that those uh, laws that they want to pass or the legislation they want to pass for, for, for those things on, on DACA. And that is why I am firmly behind having the 1996 laws repealed. When I was detained, the only organization that had any perspective like mine and like other detainees in my situation, even detainees who were innocent of the crimes they committed and were challenging their convictions in the federal courts, because also the, the um, ADPA made it possible for, uh, or made a change in the habeas corpus procedure such that it, uh, immigrants only had, or co convicted persons only had one year within which they were able to find, file a habeas corpus. And this is not an easy thing to do in a year. I mean, with the kind of things that, uh, procedures that district attorneys and so, and if you don't have a, a, a good attorney, it, will all, it could always run beyond a year. And so you find a lot of people um, in the system, in the deportation, in the deportation system, not because they actually did commit a crime sometimes too, but because of the fact that they were not able to uh, have their convictions vacated in time. As a matter of fact, another thing too is that once you exhausted, and that's, that was another change too, once you exhausted your state court remedies, right, they didn't care, uh, the immigration authorities don't care about anything else. The law allows them to deport you. Okay. Um, deportation is torture, is mental torture. And because of the limited time I have to really express that to you, and I wish I could do it on another occasion, I would read to you two letters um, that we received from persons who were detained on two different occasions. This first letter is from Dolly, this is from Dolly, and she writes, How are you feeling? We spoke earlier this very day, and you told me I'm not together. Yes, those were your words. Well, I'm hoping that by the time you receive this letter, your togetherness is in place. Since immigration law is very complicated, one needs to be whole in order to help another. You feel me? This letter is to inform you that the documents registered are herein attached, even though I have no clue why I'm sending them to you for your request. But the, here they are, and in your office's garbage can, they will be welcomed and laid to rest. Actually, this letter, she's saying in, the, in this letter that she's sending this to, to the DA. Okay. Um, she, she goes on further to, to talk about a young lady called Tiombre Castro. She said, when it comes to Tiombre Castro, she has been the easygoing woman I have, I, I have ever met. She and I had the opportunity to be housed in the same pod, and frankly, I loved her. But Bunny, as we all call her here in York Prison, was tired of being tired. She was not allowed to be in the population over something small and stupid. She felt alone. She was constantly in handcuffs and shackles, even on our day to go for INS phone calls. She used to tell me about two officers who treated her with racial slurs, and when they were on duty, if she needed anything, she'd rather go without because the answers would be a racial slur. CEO Mystic Mathias, 
and CO Stokes, while CERT Officer Baker and CO Jaley treated her as the human being that she was. They cried, were deeply touched on September 23rd, when was the date of her death. That young lady committed suicide while she was detained. A month before her death, ICE wanted an address from her. She provided that address, but she was never released. A week later, after her suicidal death, the same thing happened on the men's side. The dude was released, then picked up again by ICE. He had threatened the immigration judge and someone, and somehow found removable. He then killed himself right here in York Prison. This other letter was written by another young lady called Edwidge Helena. As I was saying on the phone, I'm not feeling too good right now and would not like to call sickness on me in this place. On Friday 12th, 2014, I started to feel really sick, like someone was punching me in the stomach. I thought it was the food, but then the next I seated, I was seated to have an intense and was having an intensive headache. I couldn't move out of the bed for two days. I put in a sick call on Sunday 14th, then on Monday the 15th, they took me to medical, but nothing happened. One of the nurses said that I was going to see a nurse practitioner on Saturday 28th or on Monday the 22nd, because my file shows, my file shows that I have been complaining about the same symptoms since February 2014. Intensive headache, dizziness, super fatigue at all times, loss of appetite, over sweating, sometimes three to four nights. A roll is unusual for me. Loss of weight right now. I can't just go on, go to the counter for med like Tylenol or ibuprofen. I had to put in to see a nurse at first. So if I do not buy from the store my own Tylenol, I have to wait day or two to three to see a nurse and get help. If it's on the weekend that we get headaches, you are on your own. I'm eating here on my own expense since a few months now and sometimes go without food for a couple of days if I can't afford to go to, to the store because I don't know what is making me sick and if I complain too much, I might end up at the medical so they can keep eyes on me. But at the medical floor, you are being isolated no access to computer and have to use the computer at least every day to write my statement for my VAWA case. So I really get angry, upset and cry in my room when I feel like I'm getting physically weak and sick. I had to get to the computer and the phone. Here are the meds so far that I have been on and off. Naproxen for the headache and antivir for this dizziness. My finances help come from another ex, my financial help comes from another ex-detainee. She really keep me up to make sure I have money to eat because she witnessed my condition when she was here and know our situation here. Not even coffee, I'm sorry, not even coffee can keep me active. This is, these are two letters, and this is not even the entire letter, but this, I hope, has given you some insight into the pains that people experience while in detention. And again, that's why I say that the 1996 laws need to be totally repealed. We don't need to have to try to, we don't need to allow them to have us deal with isolated aspects of 1996 laws. We need to change the laws. Thank you very much. just wanted to remind you oh, I'm sorry okay I'm so used to being in a class I'm just yelling so like classroom so all right so um, families for freedom wanted to remind you that there is a sign-in sheet and that if you're interested in being put on a mailing list to kind of um, keep up with uh, their campaigns and such that there is a sign-in sheet here for you um, thank you again um, so next we'll hear from Terry Watada and his novel, The Three Pleasures, explores the untold story of Japanese internment in Canada. 
told from the perspectives of three different members of the Japanese community in 1940s Vancouver, Terry chronicles how racial tension built up in the city post-World War II and escalated to Canadian police sending young Japanese Canadian men to internment camps excuse me, in BC's interior. He is also the author of the novel The Blood of Foxes, Daruma Days, Four Collections of Poetry, and more. He is visiting the workshop from Toronto. Terry Watata. Thank you, Tamara. I got that name right, right? <laughs> I am from Toronto, Canada, where it's a balmy 36, 37 degrees tomorrow. It's like spring. Well, today is like spring for me. And I hear it's going up tomorrow to over 50 degrees. Wow, that's a Toronto summer. I also want to thank the Asian American Writers Workshop for inviting me down, and especially uh, Sophia uh, Hussein, who was my uh, point person. She really did a great job getting me down here and uh, making arrangements and all that. And I'm really impressed with the workshop, it's, or this space, actually, for the workshop. Now I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna read a, an excerpt from my novel, as was said, and I, I printed out part of my manuscript because print's too small. That's how old I am. <clears throat> Not too many Canadians, and Japanese Canadians as well, know about the prisoner of war camps in Canada in the 1940s. And even fewer people know, well, know that Canadian citizens were arrested and put into those camps just because of the way they looked, because they were of Japanese ancestry. And uh, so the events depicted in this excerpt are based on true incidents. I had to get a, I had to do a lot of research and a, uh, conduct a lot of interviews with survivors of this particular incident. And this takes place in Petawawa, Ontario, which is about 20 to 30 miles west of Ottawa, the nation's capital. At about 1.30 a.m. in the morning of July 1st, 1942, the searchlights made their usual sweep of the grounds. It was a moonless night, and all was quiet in the huts, except for the deep snoring. I slept fitfully as a result, waking up every so often. Unexpectedly, loud shouting, wood splintering, and a peppering of popping sounds broke the silence. More panic cries, indistinct orders, and warning shots followed. Then firecracker explosions in the air were heard. There were sharp pings off hard surfaces and the sound of kicked up dirt as everyone woke up. I came to a seated position. Hey, you hear that, I asked. Angry voices in the room coughed. Who the hell is making all that noise? It's too goddamn early for Dominion Day. Another volley of explosions went off, but this time someone cried near the window. Holy shit, those are fireworks from the tire towers. Hit the deck. I rolled and dove to the floor just as bullets splintered the walls and strafed my bunk while other bullets ricocheted off refugee pots, pans, and skillets. Reverend Mitsubayashi covered his head with his arms as he huddled in the corner. The door to Hut 9 burst open and Taj Umeda dove flat to the floor. They're trying to kill us, he screamed. Who's shooting, Reverend shouted. The guards, the guards! Tosh spat out. Why? Where's Kakasan? Where is he? The questions remained unanswered as the noise and confusion grew and grew until at last everything stopped. A few minutes later, discontent spread like wildfire throughout the four Japanese huts. In Hut 9, everyone grumbled about the gunplay. We're rats in a cage. What have they done to Kakasan? Tosh, what happened to him? I don't know. I don't know. Ah, leave the kid alone. Can't you see he's all shook up? No one slept. At sunrise, three guards and their lieutenants stood as usual in front of their huts, waiting for the prisoners to assemble for roll call. They acted as if nothing had happened. Like everyone else, I remained very quiet. I didn't even dare move. Trosh crouched by the window and said in a low voice, They're waiting for us. 
Word via an anonymous brave messenger had come from Hut 8 a few hours before dawn. Tanaka-san orders everyone not to line up for morning roll call, he whispered. When no one came out of the huts, one by one the guards broke rank and turned to one another as if asking what to do. The lieutenant ran to the administration office outside the perimeter. As prisoner representative, Tanaka demanded later that morning to see the camp commandant with five other representatives for an explanation of the Army's action. When Sheffield responded, saying he would talk to Tanaka in the interest of clearing the air, but only to him, the inmates, including the Yamato boys, began a hunger strike. I slid between my bed and the wall, going over in my head what had happened just a few hours before. I felt myself tearing up, my hands shaking. I placed my palms over my eyes, but I still heard the gunshots. The war surrounded me, consumed me. The war then defined me. I can't go with no food, Bullet complained. Ah, Reverend laughed. Despite being deeply worried about the situation, he tried to lighten the mood. Do you good. Get rid of that belly. Come on, fellas, Tosh encouraged. Let's get serious here. The anniversary of our emperor's victory in China is approaching. Take strength from that. The barracks were filled with make-busy activity. Some of the men settled into their bunks. Others resumed an old card game. Tosh paced the floor. I thought for sure he would have broken down. He was a better man than I. Others read books, all in an effort to take their minds off the smell of bacon and baked beans wafting in from the mess hall. An unusual meal specially prepared to torment as us protesters, no doubt. Where them bastards get bacon? Ba uh, ba <laughs> Bullet came to his feet. You guys don't understand. I got to eat. We all do. Not like me, the oaf said with a pout. I think I'm addicted. Baka, you addicted to salt, Peter? I told you that stuff don't do nothing for me. Well, will you stop talking, someone demanded. They got in the groin. That's all you ever think about. Bush sheep, uh, bullets sheepishly lowered his head and fell silent under a barrage of laughter. They're playing with their heads. Don't you see that, advised the good reverend? By evening, the commandant gave in and allowed the select committee to meet, him, meet with him. Shots were fired into our sleeping quarters, Tanaka began. Is this not against regulations? Sheffield sat erect in his chair, clasped his hands together, and without a, taking a breath said, It's not against the rules. The guards are fully trained to respond to all emergencies. What emergency? There was no emergency, Roy Nishi, Nishijima, a phlegmatic man from Tanaka's hut, shouted. Ignoring the outburst, the commandant continued. In last night's incident, the internees were solely responsible because they went outside of their huts after lights out and didn't respond to orders. Tanaka betrayed his surprise. Ah, so you didn't know that, did you? Surely what your guards did was an overreaction, Tanaka responded slowly, almost sarcastically. If what you say is true, then the men must take some of the responsibility, but the guards don't have the right to fire right into our sleeping quarters. Shooting into quarters is wrong, shouted Roy. Isn't that right? No one was hurt, replied Sheffield. That's beside the point, Roy said. Easy, Roy sung. We're all reasonable men here, Reverend said in his soothing way. We'd like to talk to the Spanish Consul General about this incident. I can't allow that. Why not? Most of us are Canadian-born citizens. The rest are naturalized. Are we not allowed our citizenship rights and our human rights? It's true you were interned as POWs, Sheffield conceded. But you are, as you say, Canadian-born or naturalized citizen, and as such are not entitled to speak to the Spanish Consul. That's absurd. How so? Spain represents Japan's interests. You are considered to be British subjects, Canadians, as you said so yourselves. But you said we're POWs. You are and you aren't. It's just regulation. I'm just following regulations. My brain reeled. I said nothing. I just observed so I could write it all down in my notebook. Seeing no alternatives, Tanaka sighed. I see. It's a matter of hats. And we will always have the wrong one on when we ask for something. We have no choice but to continue not to answer roll call. Sometime during the third day of the protest, an anonymous, on, an ominous military vehicle arrived at POW Camp 33, Petawawa. 
outstepped an impressive looking officer of high rank. Lieutenant Colonel Sheffield saluted him sharply and the two marched into the administration building leaving everyone to guess who he was and what would happen next. Major General Harrison McPartland was altogether a different officer, more no-nonsense than the lieutenant colonel if that were possible, and he had no fear of open confrontation. In fact, he thrived on it. Shortly after his arrival, the major general appeared in the open and by himself headed straight for Tanaka Tokikazu's hut. All right, you layabouts. What's all this about? He barked from the doorway of the hut. Tanaka-san, perhaps a bit intimidated, shuffled forward. And whom might you be? Whom? Whom? McPartland mockingly laughed. Who the hell do you think you are, Roy cursed? Tanaka pulled him back. Take it easy, Roy, son. Let the man speak. The tin soldier dismissed the irritating fly. I'm Major General Harrison McPartland of Petawawa Military ha Headquarters. And who the devil are you? Tanaka Tokikazu, camp leader. Right. I'm here today to clear up this roll call situation. I've been thoroughly briefed and I understand why you're not obeying orders. I assure you this suiting incident will be investigated and will be treated as a separate issue. POWs must obey wartime rules and regulations, as must the military respect your rights. But know this, anyone who contravenes these regulations faces lifetime imprisonment or death by firing squad. The words weighed heavily. I could see that Roy couldn't believe that the, what the Major General was saying. But we're not POWs. Your colonel said so your, himself. McPartland ignored him, not allowing the facts to get in the way he continued. Now, I don't want to take things that far, but if you don't answer roll call, I'll be forced to take action. It's now 8.45, he said, tipping his eyes to his wristwatch. You have five minutes to get out there and form for roll call. If you do not comply... I'll be forced to take action. And you, Mr. Tanaka, will bear the consequences. The Mayor Ge Major General then snapped his heels, turned away, and headed across the compound. I and several others could see the tin soldier marching stiffly to the front gate. On the other side of the fence, a dozen fully armed soldiers stood, aiming their rifles straight at our huts. The Major General stood erect at the gate, his arm crooked to count the seconds away. Four minutes, he shouted, the voice ringing in every corner of the compound. They were ready to shoot on command. Prisoner panic erupted. Tosh swung around and shouted, oh my God, they mean it. They can't do it. We're Canadians. Doesn't that mean anything? Some scrambled to find a convenient cooking pot or pan for protection. Others closed their eyes to recite the Nembutsu. One or two called to rush the guards. At three minutes, Tanaka-san rose to his feet, gathered himself together, and walked through the door. Now enough is enough, he shouted outside. Tanaka Tokikazu, with head held high, walks right across no man's land to the Major General. He was the beacon of reason in a world gone crazy. The sun, just beginning to get hot, cast a raw light on the drama. We held our collective breath from inside our hut as the Major General, ignoring Tanaka, called out, Two minutes! No one said a word, horrified at what was taking place. Reverend murmured the Dembutsu to himself. One minute, 30 seconds. I'll stop there. You have to get the book to find out what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. Okay. So next we have up Karen Tay Yamashita. And she is the author of Letters to Memory, her visual and archival project based on family letters of Japanese internment. Um, if you don't know, she actually has a very extensive website um, of, oh my goodness. There's a whole Yamashita family archives. Okay, is that, is it connected to your project? Okay, because I was making the connection when I was reading it, but that would have been awkward if it wasn't. Okay, okay. so yes, there, is, okay. there. we have confirmed there is a website of you know, Yamashita Family Archives, and there's a lot of really interesting documents and very moving uh, stories on there that you can look up online if you're interested. Okay, um, so uh, she's the author of Letters to Memory, her visual and archival project based on family letters of Japanese internment, 
Susan Strait writes in the LA Times, Yamashita interrogates the cruelty of internment and the random nature of immigration, war, birth, and death, and disease through her own probing, lively correspondence. Karen is the author of Through the Arc of the Rainforest, Brazil Maru, Tropic of Orange, Circle K Cycles, I Hotel, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, and, and this is a great title, Anime Wong, right? Um, so, all published by Coffee House Press. She has been a U.S. Artist Ford Foundation Fellow and co-holder of the University of California Presidential Chair for Feminist and Critical Race and Ethnic Studies. Right? These very long academic titles, okay. Um, she is currently Professor of Literature and Creative Writing at the University of California, Santa Cruz. We are pleased to welcome her to New York. Please welcome Karen Tay Yamashita. Push this down. Okay, is that better? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Hi, Ed. Hi, Julie. Hi. Um, I want to thank Tamara. Thank you so much. And I'm I'm really honored to be here with um, Freedom for Families. I'm 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 honored to participate in this project. And um, I'm also sorry that. The internment camps are a precedent for the things that are happening now and things are happening again. Um, and I'm very pleased to be here with Christine and with Terry and uh, yeah, honored to read with you. Um, let's see, what am I supposed to say here? Um, this, this book is a book of letters. It's composed, oh, I can't, it's true. Like, get your, get, get, get up. Um, it's composed of five ancient storytellers um, whose spirits reside in the contemporary world. Um, and um, contemporary world in the lives of some of my scholar friends. Um, and it's about past lives um, in wartime letters, um, past lives that live in wartime letters written between members of the Yamashita family um, and their friends. So my father was one of seven siblings, and in fact, um, Christine's aunt is, is my aunt, right? Is that right? Okay. We're related. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's also about a generation of Nisei who lived through the incarceration and are now all gone, all dead. Um, so um, this is a book of letters within letters and stories within stories. And the first letters um, are written and composed to Homer. Um, Homer, as you may know, um, was a poet of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, and my Homer is also a historian of ancient Palestine. Homer. Today, April 30th, happens to be the day on which, over 70 years ago in 1942, my father and his family lost their freedom upon entry to Tamferan Racetrack, a designated assembly center in San Bruno, California, for the wartime removal of Japanese. Arriving by bus heavily encumbered with what they could carry, they were housed in a series of empty horse stalls named Barrack 14. This was just the first stop. From Tamferan, they would be transported by train into the Utah desert to live in a concentration camp named Topaz. That year, my father turned 30, the fourth of seven siblings, the three elder married with children. Five days later, my father's Issei mother, Tomi, and youngest sister, Kay, were given permission to live, leave Tamferan. Despite the registered labels, Tomi as an enemy alien and Kay as non-alien citizen, Tomi and Kay were granted passage across the continent to Washington, D.C. Kay to testify in a federal court case regarding treason and Tomi as her companion and chaperone. A map of their cross-country trek reads like a tourist pamphlet. Grand Canyon, 
New Orleans, Washington, D.C., New York, Boston. On May 9th, Kay and Tommy were traveling on the Scenic Limited of the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railway across uh, between Salt Lake and Denver. Tommy snored into her nap, but a nauseated Kay documented this passage. And, and I just want to re remember that my, Tommy could really snore. I mean, she was fell. So there she is. Just went past a place where there seemed to be a feverish building of barrack houses. The porter whispered in my ears that it's to be used for a concentration camp. Beautiful country, but God, how terribly lonely with cold and real communion with nature and not a speck of civilization in sight. Reading this, I, I don't know whether to cry or to laugh. I think Kay has taken the train to see her future, that the Negro porter has quietly suggested, when you get to your destination, not to come back, keep going. But Kay is only 24 years old, just graduated from Cal Berkeley. Her observations are not clairvoyant, but innocent. Gee, she says, Mom and I are living the life of O'Reilly, complete with a private Pullman and porter. I read and reread the letter, the jumping pulse of Kay's characteristic and enthusiastic pen flitting across the pages. I study the map, Colorado River, iron and zinc mining, snow, Continental Divide, Tennessee Pass, elevation 10,240 feet. The concentration camp under construction that spring of 1942 must have been Camp Hale in Pondo, built to house German prisoners of war and 16,000 soldiers, mostly of the 10th Mountain Division, trained in skiing and winter warfare. In my first reading, I assumed the camp to be the Amachi or Granada Japanese internment camp, but Amachi was located on the eastern end of Colorado, not along the tracks of the Scenic Limited on its approach to Denver. I'm amused by my desire for irony, but the facts don't add up. Well, the porter was mistaken, though only about the location. But there is something entirely screwball about Kay's letter, read in the context of her siblings' replies and description of their shameful, stinky, muddy, hungry, bleak imprisonment. There's a shiny, foolish airhead optimism and an uncomfortable patronage of the porter, his refined face black as night. An Oakland girl, the, the Pullman porter is guide and geographer. Holy cats, says Kay, snow. An Oakland girl who'd never seen snow. There on the Continental Divide, the train stops and the porter rushes into frozen air to scoop the white filigree into a ball. Kay marvels, like a snow cone. I could choose another passage in this archive of safe stuff. Well, you choose. Kay's sister-in-law, Keo, inscribes in her diary. Today, April 30th, was one of the worst, if not the worst day, I have ever experienced in my life. Or Sister Eo writes back, someone we know cracked up one night. Many a Nisei go around muttering, muttering the preamble of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, etc. But for me, this tableau on the Colorado Rockies sticks. Civil society in anxious, tentative peace, cast on a shield against the royal of war. Yet you, the historian, might ask, what are significant dates? Did the war begin on December 7, 1941, on a day of infamy? Or perhaps on September 5, 1905, upon the signing of the Treaty of Portsmouth and Japan's defeat of Russia? Can it begin on April 30th, as barbed wire fenced in one family among hundreds at Tamferan? Your scholarship teaches me that the war began centuries before. But for the short three generations of a family narrative and the story that puzzles me, there is May 9, 1942, on the Continental Divide, 
when a ball of snow was exchanged with unspoken recognition and mistaken geography, paths cross crossing toward hope and sorrow. I'll read a small section from a second section. These letters are to um, Ananda, who is said to have memorized the stories and words of Gautama Buddha. My Ananda is also an art historian of ancient Asia. Ananda, Ananda, you have walked, you have invited me to walk on, in meditation with you, but when we do walk, we chatter and laugh endlessly about everything, foolish nonsense, and yet, with the pleasure of the deepest sense of our living moments together, we live in noisy meditation. I suppose we would not have it any other way. To be honest, the silent meditation we experience is when we are apart, distant in our own worlds, writers in separate universes. That is perhaps the state of the writer and the letter writer, a meditative state graced by the imagination of the presence of the other. Tomi landed in the desert of central Utah, nothing but sand and sage. At the end of 1942, Tomi turned 60. She had immigrated to Oakland through the port of San Francisco at the turn of the 20th century at the fair age of 18, married Kishiro Yamashita, and bore seven children, every, one every three years from 1903 on. My Dad, John, speculated that he and his siblings were exactly three years apart because Tommy breastfed each of them until age three. <laughs> I never heard this from anyone else in the family, but maybe John had a good memory. Plus, this was the sort of raised eyebrow detail John liked to tell in the middle of some dinner party. Between raising kids and breastfeeding, Tommy also worked as a seamstress in Kishiro's Yokohama tailor's shop. In 1932, when Kishiro died, Tomi opened the Mayfair cleaners, taking in laundry and sewing jobs. When people talked about the Issei generation, you got the message that these were the real pioneers who labored, who broke their backs, scrimped and saved, lost their shirts, suffered the confusion of language and cruel, and the cruel humiliation of hatred. Then at the end of years of continuous labor, the final indignity was incarceration. As my mother, Asako, would say, no rest for the wicked. Not to say that I've had any sort of comparable life, but I'm around the same age as Tomi when she walked into Topaz. She lived to be a few months short of 90, so let's say she was about two-thirds there. Knowing Tomi, she probably wore a corset all through camp. Nothing would stop her from looking svelte. With proper posture and bosom in place, a woman of vitality. When Tommy was at the end of her life, nearing wicked rest, John flew to Chicago to be her hospice nurse. She opened her eyes one morning to find John cleaning up her room and grunted with some irritation. Mada ikteru yo. When I th think about Tommy, this is the phrase I remember. You know, I'm still alive. Thank you. for a moment, we're going to transform into our talk show. apologize for mispronouncing your last name, so that's why I was asking her, because I realized I was mispronouncing it. Yamashita. Thank you. Um, so
So we're going to have a few questions um, for the authors, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A. So I wanted to start by asking about what the experience was like um, talking with your family members or thinking through that. I know that was a process that was part of everybody's work. And Terry, you said in an interview that you didn't realize your family had gone through this, right? And, and this is a very, for those who don't know, you know, um, a lot of college students today, I teach many college students who have never heard of internment at all. But it's very common also for a lot of younger Japanese Americans, um, including activists who I've worked with who did not know that their family members had been interned, right? This is something Sonia Sanchez talks about, about teaching about internment and having Japanese American students being like, what's going on? And so I was wondering how that conversation happened in your families um, before you wrote the book and then kind of what writing the book was like in terms of that conversation with them. It's open to all three of you. So. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> Well, I, when I was a kid, I made the assumption that my grandfather um, brought his son to Vancouver in the early 20th century and said, uh, okay, this is where you're going to live. I'll get you a job. I'll get you a place to stay. And then my grandfather went home. My father was 14 at the time. Eventually, my father went back to Japan and got his blushing bride to come to Vancouver. And I always assumed they came from uh, Japan and then uh, flew to Toronto and lived and uh, prospered. I didn't know about, I knew about the war, but I didn't know they were involved in it so heavily. And until I saw a display of uh, photographs from the period, and it was the first photograph to exhibit of the internment. And uh, I was shocked, had no idea. And so I went to my mother and asked her what was camp life like? Where were they? What happened? And my mother just looked at me in horror and said, Baka, you don't need to know any of that. Baka means idiot. <laughs> and so I walked away. <laughs> and so um, what started after that was uh, a, a slow procession, not a procession, but uh, asking of questions. And I started with, uh, how did you meet dad? And again, I got rebuffed. Baka, you don't need to know that. And, uh, but I kept wearing him down, you know, after a while. My father wouldn't even talk to me. But as I kept asking more and more questions, I guess they felt compelled to a answer. And that's how it all started. I turn it into creative work. <laughs> hi, hi. <laughs> so, so Sansei is of my generation. I think what, what happened is, is that... <laughs> Um, so, you know, when we were kids, really little, um, we would hear our parents meet other people, and um, they would always say, what camp were you in? And so my, my sister and I, when we were little, thought that all these Nisei, you know, our parents and everyone made friends in camp, and that was, you know, why couldn't we go to camp? <laughs> you know, really, and I think, I think that you know, there's shame, and also they were, there was a, a feeling of not needing to protect us from that information. Um, but when, you know, we, when we became teenagers, we, we knew, and um, that, that became part of that questioning, you know, as Terry is mentioning, and um, there was also activism around uh, this. And, um, and it... it it, it's it's the, the foundation for probably Asian American activism in the, in the late 60s. Um, uh, and it, it goes along with other things that are happening at the same time, at, uh, such as the Vietnam War and um, civil rights movements. So um, I think we came into, you know, knowledge about that time and, and, and we had to learn. Uh, I'll say that I was in a different position. 
I was lucky that my father was a sociologist. He taught at UCLA and uh, devoted most of his career to researching the effects of the incarceration on the Japanese American community. Uh, so I never didn't know about it. Uh, I grew up hearing about it. Yeah, my dad is Harry Katona. <laughs> Uh, who is also mentioned, yeah, my father's Harry Kitano, uh, also mentioned in Karen's book as, right, exactly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, he was uh, very much invested in telling the stories of the incarceration. That being said, he was still of his generation, and it was not something I heard about at home around the kitchen table or anything like that. But um, you know, my mom would drop him off, drop me off at his lectures just to babysit me, right? So I would just sit in the lectures and I would learn <laughs> things that way. Um, and then you know, when I was older, I would travel with him to his guest lectures, and so that's how I learned most things. And then he passed away when I was in high school, but I was lucky that when I was working on my book, because he had done so much research and published his own stories, I had that archive of my own to return to. So for those who don't know, you know, a lot of um, Japanese Americans, and this kind of touches on some things that you talk about, um, it's part of the kind of contemporary Asian American movement, as some of you might know, comes from a lot of people who have been interned. And some of them were already uh, political before internment. So people like Kazuo Jima was part of the Communist Party. Um, she was one of the co-founders with her son, Krista Jima, um, of um, AAA, Asian American for Action. Um, Yuri Kojiyama, of course, who a lot of people know about, especially here in New York, um, was uh, interned. But she herself talked about how she never really became political until way later, right, in terms of seeing things in internment. Um, and with Harry Katano, you know, a lot of uh, Asian American sociology and critiques of the model minority myth that were emerging um, in the uh, 60s and 70s were of a lot of, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello? Can you, okay, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, people are like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, okay. We got Katano, we heard Katano. Okay, right, so, and then someone, okay, thank you, Kazembe. Okay, so, um, but, uh, uh, so a lot of um, Asian American sociologists who come in, in the 60s and 70s, they were Japanese Americans who were interned um, and who were thinking quite critically about racism. So Harry Katano, for those who don't know, um, is a major figure in a lot of the scholarship and was thinking about a lot about race politics and Japanese identity. And Gordon Hirabayashi, who had these very, you know, um, famous case against, you know, with the Supreme Court and stuff, he was also a sociologist, and he wrote his dissertation on um, uh, race identity politics and stuff. So, thank you. Um, now, I was thinking, I was thinking about the connection with also um, the work that Families for Freedom does, and one of the things that I think is, you know, when we think about um, <laughs> the way that parents sometimes or adults want to sometimes be able to maintain certain levels of privacy about their lives or about kind of some of the contours of their lives, but the way that um, when they get ensnared in the state, right, in terms of kind of either criminalization or enforcement, um, the way that it becomes a family affair in terms of families becoming more familiar with kind of maybe things that parents want to keep private or secrets or just things about their lives or relationships and stuff, sometimes through the documents, right? Um, I don't know if you guys ever remember the show Ugly Betty, right? But there is a storyline about Ignacio, the father, being possibly deported, and through that, the family was kind of tracing a lot of his life in Mexico that they never knew about, right, and kind of coming to terms with that. And so I was thinking about um, what were some of the ways that maybe as you were writing, you were kind of also negotiating what you are learning about maybe family secrets or what you didn't know, right, if you're willing to share. And I know you said something in your book about your cousins, right, at the end saying, like, you know, and you said, I'm not going to air dirty laundry, and I didn't know if there's how you kind of navigate that and talking about this kind of social experience. So whatever. <laughs> Well, I'll just start and say there, there was no dirty laundry that I found to air, but I would have done it if I had found it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, that, 
the arch the archive was something that happened because every all of the siblings died. There's seven of them, and I don't know if you're trying to clean up the mess uh, left by you know your grandparents or or people who have passed, but they save a lot of things, and it's not just Tupperware. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, you have to get rid of this, these things, and you don't know what has value and what doesn't. And uh, my cousins really packed up boxes of correspondence and documents that they thought were of interest, and they mailed it to me. Um, they thought, they had s thought somewhere that I was going to write a family history. Um, and one day, two of my cousins showed up, no, three of my cousins showed up with the idea that they were going to see my, my mother. And uh, they just brought more stuff. And there, there were films, um, tapes, um, family albums, all sorts of things. But they wanted to make sure that I was not going to talk about their mother in the way they thought that mm. I might have, you know, l l you know understood her mm. position in the family. And I said, I didn't know anything about that. Oh. And no, I was not interested in that. In fact, that was not what I was interested in writing. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to write something about attachments um, that have to do with something broader with the internment or this incarceration of Japanese at this time. And that has to do with its larger legacy and implications um, for civil rights and for, for what, it, what happened later. Um, and th that was what I was interested in. So my interests were really in some of the, the family people who, the friends who were friends of my family who were Quakers and um, people who were in the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Um, my mothers had said that the only people who helped were the Quakers um, uh, at that time, and they were the only people who seemed to care or to protest. Um, and so I began to read some of the letters that were connected to the family and to wonder about that. And I also wanted to think about why some people stand up and help and why they put their lives on the line and what they put their bodies in front of um, events that will harm other people. Um, and I think that was also my question. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, is it still on? Yes, it's still on. <coughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I think it's uh, quite dangerous to be a Japanese Canadian writer because of the, all that dirty laundry there was no mention of the camps in my family because they all spoke Japanese and I think they did that on purpose because of their wayward son whose favorite subject in Japanese language school was recess. <laughs> anyway, besides, <laughs> so there wasn't really much talk that I could understand but then it dawned on me when I started researching my first novel uh, about this character named Mori Etsuji who turned out to be the black dragon gangster leader in Vancouver, and he controlled prostitution, alcohol, all kinds of other illicit things. And I found out that my father's friend, the guy who used to come over all the time, was Modi's right-hand man. Uh, he was a gangster. And I started asking questions about this. Of course, I got all the usual, you know, baka, you don't need to know that. But eventually, I got to learn about this man. And he was a scary guy. I mean, he, he had no nose because the Chinese Tong cut it off one day because they didn't like what he was doing in Chinatown, Vancouver. But that's another story. And so, <laughs> so I... I asked uh, about R Riki Matsu, is his name, and they started telling me stories. You know, other people chimed in with stories. And uh, my editor at the community newspaper I worked at um, got the article I wrote about Riki Matsu, just a, you know, 500 word article. And he pulled me aside, and this must be, he must be the last Nisei alive because this guy's 95 now. But back then, he sat me down and quite seriously said, you don't want to write, you don't want this to be published. Why not? Well, because 
he or his minions will come after you. Modi's minions will come after you and they will threaten you and they will probably do violence to you. Oh my God. How old are these guys? Oh, I, I think they're in their 80s. <laughs> I said, well, it's, it's okay. I, I can outrun them. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, and then when the novel came out, with the central figure being this gangland leader and his right-hand man, uh, there was a, a book launch in Toronto. A hundred people came out and sold lots of books. Then I went to Vancouver, and the book was released, and people came out. Well, actually, only two people came out to the book launch. And I was at a loss. Why? What's wrong? What's going on? Well, a filmmaker friend of mine uh, put uh, people's life stories on film. And she approached one of them and said, uh, have you read this book by Terry Watata yet? And she just looked at, I mean, he just looked at her and said, I wouldn't read that book by that dumbhead Watata. <laughs> Why not? Because of all the dirty laundry in there. Have you read the book? No, but I know. <laughs> and that's why it's really dangerous to be a writer. Never mind a Japanese Canadian writer, but airing these dir this dirty laundry is, uh, yeah, ha hazardous to your popularity, I'll tell you. <laughs> anyway, that's my answer. So I wanted to ask, you talked about, um, thank you, uh, Karen, about um, being interested in engaging um, in kind of the conversations around social justice and so forth with this. And, you know, part of some of the tension in terms of the narrative of Japanese American internment um, among the activists, right, and among the people who um, in some cases were also seeking reparations um, in what eventually became a successful reparations case was the way of kind of posing Japanese people's ultimately ultra loyal and ultra patriotic, patriotic, right? And so some of the literature has debated this. So if we think about a book like No No Boy, and I, I know that's I looked up your courses and you're teaching that. Or I did my research, all right? Okay, so <laughs> I'm a sociologist, all right. So um, people are like, what, how do you know that? Okay, um, it's all on the internet. So, um, but you know, if we think about some of the literature, right, there's this ongoing debate in the historical scholarship, but also in kind of the representation of internment um, in terms of, do we talk about the no-no boys? And the no-no boys, for those who don't know, were people who refused to sign the loyalty questionnaire. Um, do we talk about Tool Lake as much as we might talk Tool Lake, Tool Lake as much as we talk about Topaz? And Tool Lake was where a lot of the political dissidents went and where they were kind of quarantined from the other people in the other camps, right? And that's still a very contested history. And so when you were writing these stories, did you feel any pressure, any kind of sense of engaging in that debate about loyalty or kind of resistance and how to pose that in your, in your writing? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, within the family, there there were seven seven children. The two oldest were sent to Japan and educated there, and then they were returned. They they returned to the United States in the 30s, just before the war, um, and they were called Kibe. So they were bilingually, um, you know, they were bilingual in both Japanese and uh, in English, and educated. Um, and the letters show and the stories show that for, for at least my oldest uncle, Uncle Seuss, that he was the oldest brother. And, and so he was the head of family. His father had died. And so he had to take over as head of family. And he had to pretend. And I'm sure he had. Um, feelings about also being Japanese, his sons would say to the end that he was always Japanese. And um, there, there's, so there was tension there and there was some kind of, there was a divided sense of loyalty for him. Um, and I'm sure he had to hide that. And to, he was, he, all of his brothers and sisters were able to leave camp because uh, at some point you could, you could leave camp as long as you didn't go back to the, the West Coast. You, would, you could go to the, um, the Midwest or to the East Coast if you got a job. 
and he could never leave. And finally, at the very end, he was allowed to leave, and the FBI files show that um, he was prohibited from leaving, that people uh, were conscious of the possibility that he, um, that he had a divided loyalty. Although, you know, people, there were letters written in his behalf. And so his children were born in camp, and so two of them were born in camp. Another child came to camp, and his wife was really the last to leave with my grandmother. So I think within families, there, there was always this, you know, this tension. Um, and I think I wanted to show that as well. Uh, I'll say that when I was working on my book, I had said that I wanted to speak through a persona. And initially, the first persona that I wanted to use was that of a Nisei woman, so a second generation Japanese American woman. Uh, because my aunts were all Nisei, and they were the ones that I had heard stories from directly. Uh, and when I was working on that, I realized that um, I feel like a lot of the literature out there is about Nisei, second generation Japanese Americans, for whom uh, the injustice of the camp, I think, was a more straightforward experience. Uh, but I feel like we don't talk a lot about the Issei, who are the first generation, and what is that to establish a life in Japan choose to leave that life, come to America, and then be put in a camp. I think there's a, there's a deeper complexity to that experience. And even though I didn't really uh, think about it at the time, I think uh, there's a, not necessarily a danger, but in a lot of Japanese American narratives, uh, we reinforce the idea that citizenship can or should be earned in some way, that if you're loyal enough, if you're good enough, if you're American enough, then you can earn citizenship. And I think that's a dangerous narrative um, that we should continue to see people, obviously, as humans and citizens. Uh, and so that's something, I think, to push back against a little bit, the idea that uh, you can earn your place in America. And just, you know, I, I found your book really interesting in the sense that it started with talking about your Korean side, right? Yeah. And so you were actually talking about kind of two wars there in terms of the Korean sure. War and the Japanese War. And is there anything you want to kind of share about what that was like to kind of think about internment through both of those lenses? Um, I didn't really combine them so much. I was just thinking about the experience of immigration itself, uh, why people choose to leave, why people are forced to leave. Uh, and it's never as straightforward as you expect it to be. And I think that's what I wanted to get at, that people make choices and decisions, and sometimes their hands are forced, and sometimes they do want to come and achieve a better life. And I think the more that we can get at the complexity of those decisions, the better. So I have one last question that um, it, I want to think about this idea of kind of um, uh, state violence how it's treated often as exceptional in, in terms of narratives of immigration. And this is something that I think Families for Freedom is really challenging, as well as other um, groups like Baji or Cav or, um, or Drum, where you know part of what people are trying to do is push back against this narrative of the United States being extremely welcoming and you know, um, a multiracial kind of you know, um, uh, space that's welcoming to everybody. And I think you know, bringing into the focus, right, these these forms of enforcement and these forms of um, vulnerability that people are targeted with. And I'm thinking about the way that when I was reading some of the reviews of your books, they would say things like, oh, it brings to focus this terrible moment in history about internment, but it would still kind of treat internment as just this exception and not kind of part of this longer continuum of state violence and surveillance and racist enforcement. And so I was wondering kind of if you could talk about what it's like to try to work against even when people are celebrating your work, kind of treating this, these issues as kind of exceptions, right? Instead of more of the rule in a lot of ways. I'm talking to everybody. I'm just, I'm just looking at you, right? Like you're my focus point, but I'm talking to everyone, okay? So. It's hard to tell sometimes. <laughs> well, um, I have to keep reminding people of other incidents in Canadian history, how the Ukrainians, because of the First World War, were put into internment camps uh, for no reason other than the fact that they were the part of the enemy. I talk about the African-Canadian uh, citizens in Nova Scotia who had to live in a segre 
get it part of town and uh, we're treated so unfairly. I have to talk about the South Asians, the Sikhs who tried to land in Canada but were denied. And in that way, at least I can, you know, spread out, you know, the, the knowledge of what's going on with people and uh, with Canadians especially. And I also try to point out that the BC politicians uh, weren't afraid of any retaliation by the Japanese military during World War II. They just saw the golden opportunity of getting rid of Japanese Canadian workers who worked for less, worked harder, the typical uh, stereotypes. And they were in the fishing industry, they were in logging, they were in farming, and it was a perfect opportunity to get rid of them. And so it, 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 it's much more than the internment itself. A lot of things going on. Uh, when I was putting together my book, uh, we had to make the decision, do I want to call it the internment? Do I want to call it concentration camps? Do I want to call it the incarceration? And I chose incarceration, and I've been trying. I've said internment for so long, but I've been trying to train myself to say incarceration, because I think that word positions it in a larger history that it's not just this one thing, the internment. It's incarceration, and it's part of a longer history of the United States and its carceral policies. So that's one way to think about it. I just thought of another point. <laughs> At the, close to the end of World War II, the Canadian government, in its wisdom, uh, legislated deportation. And of course, that relates to today. And uh, they told Japanese Canadians in the camps, you have a choice. Give up your citizenship and move to Japan or move east of the Rockies. No more will you go back to the coast. And uh, that, of course, is deportation. And a lot of the Niseis, second generation, Canadian born citizens, went with their parents because the parents said, you must come with us. And so they gave up their citizenship and it took decades for them to get back to Canada as Canadian citizens. When I started the project, this was a project for, of a family archive. And um, there, were f there were hundreds of letters and documents that I combed through and looked at. And um, I finished the project about the time my mother died. And so she was the last Yamashita um, of her generation. And um, so I thought that, that finishing the book and also writing about this was would put some kind of closure on what had happened to that family, to my family, um, and that there could be some kind of reconciliation, but a reconciliation that had a longer legacy for all of us. Um, but then the book took about three years to be published. It was published last year, and you know what happened. Um, and um, it's been going on, and it's, it's very troubling, and then to come out to and read about, read the book, and then also to have to make all these connections again and again and again, and to, um, to feel that I have to bone up on immigration policies that go back to the 19th century, and to think about the, the long history of racism and uh, anti-immigrant policies, um, how we've treated people who are refugees, and it's so sad to me. This has been very, very hard for me to talk about my book. I want, I want everybody to read everything they can read and to put their bodies in front of what's going on. Thank you very much. So um, on that note, how about if we open it up to the audience? I believe there's a person right there who has their hand up. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the panel for really, you know, 
letting your heart out about this issue. I really appreciate it. Um, I actually have a question for all three of you, especially Terry. Um, so I, I've been at a very big interest in Japanese, uh, Canadian, and American history, especially as it relates to military history during World War II. And you know, one of the things is when I was in school, we learned about Japanese American internment through the context of the 442nd Regiment and, you know, stories like that. Um, and it was only until later when I was in college that I learned that it was actually very controversial at the time. And to this day, it's actually something which can bring up a lot of different emotions, some very positive and some very negative. Um, there were some parents who did disown their sons for joining the military. And I wanted to know, um, hopefully this isn't too much of a personal question, um, you know, have you found this in any of your studies or any of your research uh, on b both sides of the border? Thank you. Well, the uh, man that warned me about uh, Rikimatsu the gangster, <laughs> he was a veteran of World War II. And he told me the story that all the Nisei wanted to join the Canadian military. But the Canadian military said, no, we don't want you. There was this one man I know in Vancouver. He went to every recruiting station right across the country, <laughs> from Vancouver all the way to Newfoundland, and nobody would take him. And uh, they had to settle for that. But then the British government said, the British government said, you don't want them? We will take them. Uh, into our military and the Canadian government was so um, embarrassed they said okay we'll take them <laughs> but only as interpreters <laughs> so they went into the military and became an interpreters and went to the South Pacific and worked there so uh, that's the history of the Japanese Canadians in the military oh of course in World War One. It was an actual battalion of Japanese Canadians in Europe fighting. And they distinguished themselves immensely. In fact, so much so that they were the only ones allowed to vote after they got home. <laughs> Until World War II, and then that was all taken away. Thank you. Does anyone have another question here? Okay, in the back, I believe. Um, there's one right there. Hi, first of all, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your stories. I'm interested in the process of telling as much as the product of it, especially considering oral history traditions that exist in a lot of Asian cultures, but have perhaps been disrupted through the trauma of in, that happens in diaspora. So I was wondering, in the process of learning these histories, how has your relationship with your families changed? And if your families have had a chance to read your work and how have has that changed your relationship to them? Uh, it, work <laughs> it, it works, it's okay. Uh, I'll just answer quickly for myself that, uh, like I said, my, my father's work uh, was my major source for this, and so everything had been published and he had passed away. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons that I went into a fictional persona that I felt like I had to rediscover the material in some way. Um, my family has, has read my book and they all like it. <laughs> well, I found that alcohol is a good thing. <laughs> but I do know that um, when talking to Niseis and some Niseis, they didn't like to tell you much uh, because uh, as going back to dirty laundry again, but eventually, you know, you, as I said, you give them some alcohol and they're willing to talk, tell you all kinds of things. Uh, all kidding aside, though, once I went on an internment camp tour, in fact, two or three of them uh, out in BC, and I was with a whole bunch of Niseis and Iseis, and just going back to those places, loosen their tongues, and all these stories came forward, and it was just amazing. Now, the, uh, the only one in my family to have read any of my work was my brother, who is uh, 18 years older than I am. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2012. But uh, it was a revelation to him. The kid can write. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, he, he enjoyed it. And he often, at family gatherings, he would hold up the book and say, 
you know, it's a good book, but, you know, this didn't happen, or that didn't happen, or that didn't happen. And my wife would say, it's fiction. <laughs> <laughs> so? <laughs> anyway, so, um, I think it was Mordecai Richler, a great Canadian writer, once said, don't expect your friends or family to read your work. And it's so true. I, um, I, I, I had done a little trip uh, around my mother's family, and I had recorded some of their stories. And I wrote a kind of essay about this. And uh, I, I, was, I was actually studying in Brazil at the time, and so I, I mailed it over to the Rafa Shimpo, that's uh, a newspaper over in Los Angeles. And the guy who was editor there was Frank Truman, and he was going to publish it. But I also sent um, a copy of that to my mother, and my mother went crazy. And my father told me later that my mother made him get in the car and drive all the way from Gardena, you know, to, to Little Tokyo. And she walked into the Rafa Shimpo, said, where's Frank Truman? Went to Frank Truman, said, give me that story. And she took it away from him and walked out. Mm. Then she wrote me a long letter while I was in Brazil telling me why, if I ever published that, how I would really offend my family. Um, and so I never wrote about them again. I really didn't. Um, and I didn't want to hurt her feelings, but I, I had to respect them. Um, my friend said that was, that was really bad of my mother to have done that. And she, he wanted, one of my friends, Garrett Hongo, said, I'm going to tell your mother that was a bad thing, because <laughs> look at you, you've never written about us. And, uh, and I have, I really haven't for, for um, and you know that about all my books. Mm -hmm. This is the first time, and you know they're all dead. Um, I think I felt free finally. But I think also I was right in my father's side, and they were, you know, I think they're, they were pretty jolly about it. They would like it. Mm -hmm. but, but my mother's side of the family would really be upset, I think. And they still are secretive about, you know. So, you know, kind of thinking about um, the story you're sharing about with the newspaper, right? And thinking about your question about diaspora, kind of, um, uh, if we think about just kind of the ethnic communities, because you're, you're, you know, Terry's book is, um, uh, it's, the narrator is a fictitious character, but he writes for what was a real newspaper, the New Canadian. Yeah. And the New Canadian was the only uh, Japanese Canadian newspaper that was still publishing during internment. And so I'm kind of curious about what has been kind of the reception among um, different Japanese American organizations or institutions who have read your work in terms of how they feel it connects or represents or, or anybody, you know. <laughs> I'm just going to stare into the air and anybody who wants to answer. <laughs> I really don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I get invited to read. So here's an institution that has, you know, honored my work, and I read here before, and I'm very honored, and you've been very gracious over the years, and I love to come to New York read for you. Um, but I wouldn't say that, you know, JACL groups are, you know, clamoring to have me there. They really <laughs> don't care. <laughs> I don't think so. They, they did tweet the event, just to let you know. They did? Oh, yes, oh okay. sorry. Thank you, JCL. I love you. <laughs> I, believe, I think they did, because I was like, oh, JCL's doing that? OK. Right. JCL is the Japanese American Citizens League, and it is the oldest Asian American civil rights organization, according to its website. So, yes. And, and, and it's also considered a little more non-left. That's, that's where it leaves. I have to say the same thing, that the more conservative elements of the Japanese Canadian community <laughs> did, um, have not embraced my work at all. And, uh, but on the other hand, the um, NAJC, which is the equivalent, not the equivalent of the, of the American JCCA, whatever it's called. J yeah, JACL. All these letters, I don't know. But yeah, the NAJC has embraced it and uh, 
has invited me to various uh, chapters across the country to read and talk uh, when they can afford it. And uh, that's been very gratifying. So yes, yes and no. <laughs> I think not a lot of people read poetry. <laughs> so well, tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> so the people who do read poetry are very supportive of it. And We have time for two questions real quickly. Okay. Yeah, uh, um, okay. Yes. I think this person in the front right here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for all very much for, for coming tonight. Um, I, my husband's Japanese, and I lived in Japan for a decade. And, um, but my stepfather's family were all Holocaust survivors by pretending to be Gentiles and moving actually into Austria f to volunteer for work. And I discovered this when I was, when I was 14, oh no, uh, yes, when I was 14, the Eichmann trial um, was um, televised and my own family are all third generation Russians and no one had anything to do with the Holocaust. And this, the Eichmann trial was an extremely moving event for me and it changed my whole life. Um, and my mother, rem my father died and my mother remarried and she married a man whose entire family were Holocaust survivors. And when I was in my 20s, I discovered that no one had written down the history. And I started interviewing people. And by this, at this point, um, their children were all in their 20s or older, and they were willing to talk. But until then, they hadn't told anybody. So this, this all resonates with me. It takes a very long time, I think, for survivors to be willing to talk. Um, and so I, I was honored to be able to write down the history. The second, just a second point, No No Boy is being uh, produced f this entire month uh, by the um, Pan-Asian Repertory Theater in New York, and it's a wonderful production, and I urge you all to go see it. Thank you. Okay. I guess real Hi, uh, thank you so much for the talk. It was very insightful. Um, my question is, um, hope just like sort of a transition from the last couple of points that was said, uh, but uh, you all uh, documented or wrote about very personal um, experience and stories of a generation um, who experienced something that you didn't. And I was wondering if you, if there ever was a fear of, um, you know, sort of not doing justice enough to the narratives that you were retelling, um, either telling it too much or telling too little of it? And if so, how did you um, navigate that? Well, uh, someone mentioned Gordon Hirabayashi's name. And uh, I once talked to him and I said, uh, well, he, I mean, he was in the Canadian redress movement. And so, so was I. So I talked to him and I said, why are we doing this? Why, why are we asking for money, you know? I mean, it, it seems so tawdry somehow. And I got a lot of backlash for that too. And so he said, it's the only thing that Canadians understand. You do a wrong, you get paid. And so that is my justification. If I want to talk about this, a wrong was done. A human right was disgraced. And so that's how I get over that in my mind. Uh, yeah, I was really worried about that. That was something I was constantly working on. And this book was also part of my PhD dissertation. So there was this pressure that I had to write it, I had to defend it, and I had to do a good job, whatever that meant. And at some point, I, I think it pushed me to keep revising and working on the poems and trying to think about how to make this a real character, a real speaker. And then at some point, I had to let go of that and say that telling the story, even if I'm not the best person to do it, um, I had to be okay with that. Well, I've been impersonating a lot of folks for a long time. Um, in my fiction, and uh, I apologize, really, to just sorry. <laughs> um, uh, and and I can talk about that, you know, in different ways, um, inhabiting, you know, that those voices. But for this particular um, work, I I've, I I took a long time to try to figure out to whom I was speaking. And so it was very important to me to find these storytellers to talk to. Um, and um, they're both ancient storytellers, but they're also scholarly friends of mine. 
Um, so they were sort of a fictional muse, muses to whom I could speak. And then when I knew who I could tell what I felt to, to whom I could be talking to, I knew, I'm, I think I knew how to write and how I could open up what was painful inside of me, but also what would be honest. And then also to take the material from these letters and to reproduce them for you. Um, and I, th I don't know, I feel okay about it, finally, even though everyone's passed and I can't say, what do you think about this? It's, it's sad for me, but yeah. Thank you. Um, so Karen, I just want to commend you especially very quickly for your very raw honesty in expressing the agonizing that you are going through right now with the Trump regime coming to power and what this means for having to renew um, you know, research and you know, searching and discovering why is it that we're in this situation and how we get out of it. Um, paraphrasing. Uh, I just wanted to commend, and I think that that honesty is important. Uh, just very quickly, I wanted to read something, and I'm going to try and get a copy to, of this to you as well, because I think... Sorry, do you have a question? Yes, I do. For everyone who is, you know, sort of in, the same, in a similar position, there is a film that I want you to watch, Karen and everyone else. It's called The Trump-Pence Regime Must Go. In the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. A better world is possible. It's a film of a talk by Bob Avakian. And as you are you know, sort of researching and digging into why we got into the situation and how we get up out of it, this film concentrates in one hour, decades of research into the rise of fascism in the United States and how to get out of it. So I'll get a copy of this to you, Karen, and so to everyone else. I just wanted to personally commend you because not enough people are actually saying what needs to be said, which is that this is a nightmare that needs to be stopped. want to kind of make sure we stick to the timeline or whatever so um, at nine so um, I want to thank everybody on the panel um, all of the authors and again I want to thank AAW um, and I hope everybody has a good night I guess there's a reception that we're having and buying books <coughs> and get a chance to talk to the authors thank you very much